I have with me a very special guest right here, Singapore's Minister for Home Affairs and Law, Mr. K. Shanmugam. Welcome to We Answer. Thank you. Let me begin by asking you for your perspectives on the way forward for India and Singapore and the path covered so far in terms of the shared priorities and concerns. You start with the deep historical links and then we look at that and we look at the way forward. You know, more than 8,000 Indian companies are in Singapore. They see the potential of ASEAN, which is you know, a shade under $3 trillion in terms of GDP. And uh, Singapore is a good place as a regional headquarters, as a place for treasury functions, and also as a place to base your people in order to go around the region and do business in the region. That's at the economic level, and Singapore has been a very strong proponent of uh, Indian economic engagement with Singapore and the region and also a key supporter of uh, India's uh, strategic engagement with ASEAN. So in India and ASEAN are strategic partners. Uh, India is in a number of other fora, EAS for example. And with the growth of the Indian economy and the growth of the uh, ASEAN economy, and for me, leaving aside quarter on quarter issues, uh, the secular trend from both uh, India and Southeast Asia is strong growth and there is a lot of potential and synergy. Right. And India has already strongly welcomed the ASEAN outlook for Indo-Pacific. Yes. Uh, what is your impression of uh, the many signals that the two sides have given out so far? If you look at AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, it sets out a framework for engagement, um, rules-based, how we can engage economically, uh, how we can deal with issues, ASEAN centrality, which is important for ASEAN because individually some of the countries are smaller, some are bigger, but you know, we look at ASEAN centrality and we want countries to support that. Mm -hmm. As I said, it has to be underpinned by willingness on both sides and the Prime Minister Modi's uh, statement last year at the Shangri-La Dialogue on Look East and the uh, centrality and uh, the way India will engage with the region was very welcome and India has taken a number of steps along those lines. We are speaking at a very interesting time. A lot of shifts taking place across the world in, in the geopolitical equations. And one of the factors has also been the rising tensions between the US and China. Do you see that as an opportunity for ASEAN? Not much. Uh, if you look at ASEAN, you look at Singapore, mm. in fact, uh, even India and bigger economies like India, Really, we all do better if trade tensions come down and international trade flows easily across borders. And then there are competitive advantages. You know, each one does something that they are good in. Mm. And it is a globalized, interconnected world. Globalization has brought a great deal of prosperity. How that prosperity is to be shared out within a country, you need the right policies to make sure that, you know, there is a degree of equity and... Uh, everybody benefits from it. Leaving that aside, which is important, but domestic. Tensions, uh, difficulties, instability, particularly between the two largest economies in the world, is not good news for anyone, either individually or collectively. It's interesting that you say that, and also then talking about uh, the many facets to the relationship between India and ASEAN. You have spoken about India unlocking the true potential uh, as far as those opportunities are concerned. Help us better understand how India can take that relationship forward. Okay, India is at uh, th about $3 trillion now. And, uh, you know, you will expect that to double within seven to eight years uh, with the right environment and right policies and then double again thereafter. And it can be faster if higher growth rates are achieved. ASEAN is growing at 5%, and again, it's a share under 3 trillion. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's higher than the world average of 3.8% or so. So, and a young population, 640 million pe people, hardworking, who believe that tomorrow will be better than today, who strive just like Indians do, to make sure that their children have a better life, focus a lot on education. So you have two, uh, sort of uh, populations 
with a broadly similar outlook. Of course, ASEAN has been culturally very influenced by both India and China. If you look at Cambodia, for example, the Khmer Empire, you look at the names of the kings, Jayavarman, Suryavarman, Indravarman, Ramayana is deeply etched into the psyche of people in Southeast Asia. You look at Malaysia and Kedah, you know, it's got artifacts from uh, South India, 10th century Chola Empire. So the connections are deep and historical. Likewise with China, influenced by both and of course subsequent European influence. There is a lot of potential that India can look at ASEAN as a market and ASEAN can also look at India as a market. There is a free trade agreement between mm. the two places. Uh, a common threat that is uh, uh, being fought against uh, by countries across the world, specifically in South Asia and Asia, uh, has been the fight against terrorism. Uh, yes. Singapore has taken a lot of steps uh, in its war against uh, that menace. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the challenges involved and uh, uh, the many lessons that you think, in a way, uh, those steps also offer. Let me start by making a point which might then indicate that I'm not sure what lessons there are for a much more complex and bigger place. I mean, if you were to talk about India and Singapore, right. at one level we are both countries, sovereign countries, but at another level, the complexity of India, the mosaic, is Absolutely. very different from Singapore. Absolutely. In a small place, 760 square kilometers, 3.2 million citizens, a total of 5 million people in the island, including uh, permanent residents and uh, uh, guest workers. We have long before terror became a watchword, 9-11 and so on, long before that, from the 1960s, we identified the fault lines along race and religion as critical to be dealt with uh, for internal security purposes. A country cannot be stable, it cannot progress, if you don't have peace and harmony within the country. Right. Race and religion are very serious factors which can damage that. So we took, uh, we put in legislation which uh, is, uh, you know, get, empowers the government to deal with these issues very quickly. And we have used those powers in the 60s and 70s and subsequently. Uh, since 9-11, oh, people have been arrested too and we have zero tolerance for this. Uh, any form of uh, violence along racial or religious lines. Mm -hmm. But what that has meant is that the large bulk of society has been uh, free of terror, free of violence. Um, safety indices always rank Singapore very highly. Uh, and people feel safe and secure walking in the streets of Singapore. Mm -hmm. Any young woman or old lady can walk almost at any time of the day or night in any part of Singapore without feeling uh, worried. You, your 10-year-old child can take public transport and you wouldn't be worried about it. Speaking of a different kind of a war, the one that Singapore has been waging is the one against fake news. Yes. And the Protection from Online uh, Falsehoods and Manipulation Act has right. been a strong measure that's been taken by the country. Uh, it's not yet in force. It was passed by Parliament Yes. Uh, in May. Yes. Uh, the regulations that will uh, give the f effect to it are being drafted, it, you know, and uh, it will come into force once the gazetting takes place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's a debate on f online falsehoods. The fact that uh, it can cause a great deal of harm mm -hmm. has been understood by the population. And we see a discernible uh, pattern. There is already a reduction in the kind of falsehoods that go around. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, what right of free speech do fake accounts, bots, you know, control from overseas, uh, others who want to do bad things in society, what right of free speech is there? So we deal with that. And as far as uh, speech, which uh, are opinions or people's views on policies, government, public interest, public affairs, that continues, that's not affected by the legislation. The legislation impacts on falsehoods right? and uh, it allows the minister to ask the person who carried, uh, put out the original falsehoods, provided they are false and they affect public interests. Right. 
And speaking specifically about hate speech, in yes. India also it's a growing menace. Uh, Everywhere in the world. Absolutely. How do you think social media platforms should be regulated? There are three sort of stakeholders. There are the people who are at the receiving end of this hate speech, and hate speech tends to eventually normalize itself in society and make people, uh, some people, more violent. And violence ensues, as we have seen in Western Europe, we have seen it in the US, we have seen it in other places. So from a Singapore perspective, we don't see what right there should be for hate speech or offensive speech, which is targeted at another race or religion. So we take a very strict approach. Now, so the population is a stakeholder. Discussion on religion is fine. Propagating your own religion is fine. Freedom of religion is guaranteed. But there is no basis for attacking somebody else on the basis of race or religion. Then the other stakeholders are, of course, the uh, internet or social media companies. They are the platforms through which uh, some part of this flows. And the third stakeholder is the government. Governments have to do what they have to do, which is that it cannot be subcontracted out to somebody else and say self-regulation. Governments are responsible for the safety and security of people. So you have to have the legislative power to deal with it. But at the same time, you want to be able to interact and work closely with the social media platforms so that there is a degree of self-regulation as well. So all three will have to work closely together. And speaking of basic freedoms, uh, yes. Hong Kong has been on the boil now for more than three months. Uh, tensions have been on the rise. How do you see the demands that have been made by the protesters uh, so far asking for more uh, autonomy and saying that uh, the principle under which the handover took place uh, has been eroding over time. I am not a deep expert on the uh, rules and the basic right. laws and treaties. But uh, a demand I, for more autonomy. I understand. Yes. Right. In fact, my views are set out on the, my ministry's website, yes. the, the transcript. Which is yeah. why I'm asking you this. <laughs> I will summarize it this way. Hmm. It's in no one's interest for these protests and violence to continue. There's got to be a solution. If, insofar as the uh, demands, the economic aspirations of young people, every government has got a duty to meet them. Mm. However, I see that the protesters are also, and you've alluded to it in your question, uh, raising uh, a number of ideological, philosophical issues. Uh, for that, my point is going to be, first, I think it has to be understood that Hong Kong is part of China. It's part of the sovereign state of China, and nobody, I think, questions that. Second, uh, China is not going to allow Hong Kong uh, you know, to have a different, completely different political system or go beyond what the current legal framework, including the basic law, allows. And I don't know to what extent the demands of the protesters are consistent with the basic law. I'm not an expert. But uh, I think that uh, to believe that you can go for, say, uh, a whole series of rights in Hong Kong, which are not uh, in the basic law mm. and which would be seen as uh, aimed at the rule of the Communist Party of China. I can't see how uh, China will agree to that. And I can't see how the rest of the world can see that as, uh, you know, can be supportive of such a situation. Even India, if any part of India, students went on the streets and uh, pelted the police and said they wanted uh, uh, autonomy or independence or whatever, uh, I think the Indian authorities will take a very similar view. Of course, the political systems are different. Mm -hmm. But we've got to start with uh, sovereignty. Right. Uh, Singapore has also laid a lot of emphasis on promoting startups and attracting top talent. Uh, what are the ways in which Singapore is trying to further those moves? First, the question is talent. Your education system has to produce talent. You know, you don't have a problem because of your uh, numbers and uh, your top quality universities. We have a much smaller base. We've got to enhance that. Second, uh, you know, 
particularly again more relevant for a smaller place, you've got to be open to talent which can work with and enhance your country's potential. Third, you've got to have the fiscal and uh, legislative framework that uh, encourages this. And uh, we have uh, reasonably, uh, I think one can be reasonably and cautiously optimistic about our startup environment. I wouldn't venture to compare it with the Indian yes. environment. It's very different, right? Scale and size is very different, but we are not too badly off. But would you have some recommendations for India's uh, uh, tech ecosystem? You know, I have nothing but uh, admiration for what I know of the Indian tech ecosystem. Young people full of uh, vibrancy and intellect and uh, really, uh, uh, you know, trying to change the world. I will say good luck to them, best of luck to them. There, Many of them are succeeding, both here and elsewhere. On that note, uh, we can uh, wrap this up. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure interacting with you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.